This is a new day, a day of celebration, for God has given us a new birth, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. He's rescued us from the darkness. He's brought us out of despair. In Him we have redemption. In Him we have mercy. In Him we have forgiveness. Today we stand in Christ a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Today we celebrate our Savior, our Deliverer, our Redeemer. Sin is conquered. Death is defeated. The grave is empty. And Jesus is alive. This is a new day. This is Easter. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. It's a great day to worship, and we're going to celebrate the risen Savior. Jesus said, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So get up off your couch. Get out of your chair. Let's worship together. Come on. I was buried beneath my shame. That's it. Come on. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. And I was breathing, but not alive. And all my failures I tried. To hide, it was my dream till I met you. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Let's sing it together. Come on. Here we go. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were.
glorious God and what a glorious day this Easter Sunday. Alright, as we continue our time of worship today, we are going to be celebrating the ordinance of baptism. We have coming today Mr. Nathaniel Durham. Come on down, Nathaniel. Awesome, I'm just going to turn you around here. Nathaniel, I have two questions for you, buddy. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Yes, sir. Do you desire to live for Him? Yes, sir. Awesome, because you know Jesus as your Savior, and because you desire to live for Him, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome. What a great way to celebrate Easter, watching someone go through the waters of believer's baptism, following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives. I can fail.
Sing a little louder. 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 Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live.
walked out of the grave I'm a walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm a walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm a walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm a walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm a walking to Good morning and God bless you this Easter Sunday. Thank you for joining us at First Baptist Middleburg. If you are watching on Facebook, we would ask that you like us or that you check in with us. If you are a guest, we would ask that you go to our church website at the conclusion of the service and fill out the guest registration form. Dr. Chris Bontz, who works with the Jacksonville Baptist Association, will be sharing today's message. Later on in the service, we will give you information as to how you can give of your tithes and offerings, and we would ask that you prayerfully consider giving to our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. All the funding that's given to that specific offering will go to support missionaries right here in North America. Thank you once again for joining us this Easter Sunday. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church Middleburg. Not the way I greeted you the last time I was here. Today we're online. This is kind of virtual church, a little different than Easter than any of us have ever experienced. But it's Easter nonetheless. And we're, we're gathering today electronically because Christ is risen and he's on his throne. And that changes everything about our predicament right now. I want to read to you the words of one of my favorite poems I refer to every Easter season. Tomb, thou shalt not hold him longer. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, the light. Stronger than the wrong, the right. Faith and hope triumphant say, Christ is risen. It's Easter day. You know, resurrection is of huge importance to the Christian faith. The Apostle Paul actually said, if Christ is not risen, then our faith is in vain. But Christ has been raised. It's the most verified miracle in antiquity. Jesus Christ appeared to over 500 witnesses after his resurrection. He inspired a band of cowards who had scattered just days before to go out and proclaim the gospel and be willing to be martyred for their faith rather than recant of the truthfulness of the gospel. And it may surprise you to know that Jesus is actually not the only person that's ever been raised from the dead. If you go back to John 11 in your Bibles, you'll read that Lazarus was raised from the dead after being in the tomb for four days. We don't commemorate the resurrection of Lazarus. Have you ever thought about that? Ever thought about why we don't commemorate the resurrection of Lazarus? Well, the answer to that question lies in who Jesus is and what his resurrection accomplished. To answer the question of why we celebrate the resurrection of Christ and not the resurrection of Lazarus, we need to understand who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what Jesus will do in the future. 
And this morning I want to turn to a slightly unusual text for Easter, but one that is apropos for us today and every day especially. But in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, we read these words from the Apostle Paul. The Holy Spirit says through Paul, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. In this text, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is called to focus on Jesus Christ, to follow Jesus Christ, and to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are three truths about the church in this passage. Number one, we're the household of God. We're not a club. We're not a social organization. We are the literal household of God. We are his dwelling place, the church. We're the gathered people of the living God. He's not dead. He is risen. He's alive. And while we may be gathering electronically today and our our in-person gatherings have been placed on hold and we're longing for the day when we can get back together, we're still gathering. We're, We're still communicating. We're still sharing. We're still relying on one another and looking to the risen Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Third, this text teaches us that we are a pillar and a buttress of the truth. We're actually called to defend the gospel, to stand for the gospel, and to proclaim the gospel. And the Apostle Paul, inspired and carried along by the Holy Spirit, says in this text that great indeed, we profess, is the mystery of godliness. Now, mystery in the Bible, that's Uh, That doesn't refer to something that we can't understand. Sometimes we'll use the word mystery that way. But in the Bible, when the word mystery is used, it refers to something that once was hidden, but now has been revealed. In the Old Testament, the truths of Jesus Christ were hidden. They were partially illuminated. They were foretold. They were foreshadowed. But in the ministry of Jesus and in the cross of Christ and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, the truth of the gospel, God's redemption plan for the world, has been revealed. And after Paul gives us these three truths about the church, he quotes a song that was sung and chanted by the early church that summarizes the gospel and helps us to understand the significance of the resurrection. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory." Church, listen to me. The gospel is an announcement of the cosmic victory of the Lord Jesus Christ over the powers of evil, over death itself. It's a declaration of a victorious king who calls all of us to forsake everything and follow him. So here's our big idea this morning. Write this down. Take note of this. The big idea. The king who died our death is the king who gives us life. And this morning as we gather electronically, As we open up our Bibles and begin to examine this passage in 1 Timothy, as we reflect upon the strangest Easter the church has ever celebrated in its 2,000-year history, we're still celebrating the resurrection of Christ. It may be different but it's a celebration nonetheless. And there are six things that we celebrate, six uh, phrases in this song that would be good for all of us to remember and meditate on this Easter Sunday. The first thing we see and the first thing we celebrate when we gather for Easter is we celebrate the humiliation of the Son of Man. The, the, the song begins by saying he was manifested in the flesh. He was manifested. That means he was revealed. It, it points to the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has always existed from eternity past, but there was a time when he left the glory and the splendor of heaven to come to earth to accomplish the mission that the Father had given him. And we call it his humiliation because he left the glories and the splendor of heaven where he was worshipped by hundreds of thousands of angels, where he did not experience the limitations of a human body, and he left all of that to come to earth. He was humiliated as he was despised and rejected by the very ones he came to save. 
He was humiliated as he was nailed naked to a cross, dying the death of a criminal between two criminals. He was humiliated as he was mocked as a failure. People stood around looking at the cross and his enemies chanted, he saved others but he cannot save himself. He was humiliated because the Bible says he who knew no sin was made sin on the cross, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And he died on the cross, revealing that he was really a man. And the Bible teaches that he died in your place and my place, bearing the Father's wrath for my sins and for your sins, that we might be redeemed, that we might be saved from our sins, be saved from the penalty for our sin, the penalty of death. This Easter Sunday, I want you to remember one very important thing about the cross. The cross means that the very worst thing that could happen to you has already happened to Jesus. And because it's happened to Jesus, it will not happen to those who place their faith and confidence in him as Savior. The Bible says that Christians have been crucified with Christ. His death becomes ours by faith when we trust in him as our Lord and Savior. Second thing we celebrate this Easter Sunday and every Easter Sunday and every time we think about the gospel is we celebrate the vindication of the Son of God. The next phrase is he was vindicated by the Spirit. Now, the first time we see the Son vindicated is at his baptism, where where the Father speaks and he says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. But the clearest time we see the vindication of the Son is in the resurrection. When, When Jesus hung on the cross, his enemies mocked him. They said he saved others, he cannot save himself. Uh, They sat around waiting. Well, let's see if God, who he claims to be his father, is going to help him. Well, guess what? God did help him. Three days after Jesus suffered uh, the unbearable humiliation of the cross at the hands of sinful men, God undid what sinful man had done. Jesus was charged with blasphemy, but he was vindicated as God. He was crucified as a criminal. But when he, was risen, when he was raised from the dead, he was vindicated as innocent of all charges. He was crucified as a pretender to the throne, but he was vindicated as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ was vindicated as a truth teller. Everything he ever said about himself was proven to be true. I mean, you think about this. Of all the things that Jesus taught, the most unbelievable thing he ever said was, if you kill me three days later, I'm coming back from the grave. The most unbelievable prophecy of Jesus Christ was shown to be true when he rose from the grave. He was vindicated as a truth teller. And if we can believe that, then that means we can believe everything else he ever said and taught. We can believe every word that we find in the scriptures, God's word. He was vindicated as a truth teller. But we don't just celebrate the resurrection because of what it means for Christ. We celebrate it for what it means for us. The king who died our death is the king who gives us life. He was risen for God's glory. He was raised for God's glory, but he was raised for our good as well. Romans chapter 4 verse 25 says that Jesus teaches that Jesus was raised for our justification. He was raised so that he could give us the gift of resurrection. He was raised so that he could give us the gift of eternal life. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 45, in his resurrection, Jesus Christ became a life-giving spirit. It's because of his resurrection that he is able to dwell within us and to empower us to live the life that God calls us and commands us to live. Literally, the resurrected king is resurrecting you and he's resurrecting me. His resurrection is our resurrection. The firstborn among many brothers, the scriptures teach, and we get to experience the benefits of that life now. When someone repents of their sin and looks to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and asks him to save them from their sins, they're immediately adopted into God's family, sheltered in a place of eternal security and safety. And the Bible teaches that nothing can separate us from the love of God. 
nor neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation the scriptures say can separate us from the love of god the government can't separate us from the love of god our enemies can't separate us from the love of uh, from the love of god a broken economy can't separate us from the love of god and a virus can't separate us from the love of god and so we celebrate the vindicated christ who rules and reigns on his throne rules and reigns in our hearts the life-giving spirit that is resurrecting us and has promised a physical resurrection at his return so we gather for easter and we we celebrate the humiliation of christ he suffered in our place we celebrate the vindication of christ as he was raised from the dead he was vindicated in everything he said and everything he did and we also celebrate the exaltation of christ you look at the third phrase in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says he was seen by the angels. And we think about angels at the resurrection, and we think of two, right, sitting on the rocks on either side of the tomb after Jesus, uh, after the tomb is empty and the disciples are there, and they're saying, why are you standing around here waiting? He's gone. Go do what he told you to do. But in Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, Jesus actually said that he could have called over 72,000 angels to come to his defense at any moment. I want you to think about that. This host of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of angels who had worshipped Jesus Christ for millennia in heaven prior to his coming to earth. Imagine their thoughts as they watched the Son of God leave the privileges of heaven for a sinful and rebellious people. See, there's no plan of redemption for angels. God hasn't done this for them. Imagine their horror as they watched, stunned, as humanity nailed their creator to the cross. Imagine their restraint as they waited, as the sun hung on the cross and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Imagine their, their restraint that they must, uh, the, the, the overwhelming emotion they must have felt as they waited for the father to snatch his son from the hands of the enemy. And then imagine the celebration as squadrons of angels escorted their exalted king back to his throne in triumphal procession. So beautiful is the message of the gospel that, that our king would die in our place so we could receive the gift of eternal life. That 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 tells us that angels long to investigate it. They, they long to look into it. They long to experience that love. It, it, it's so unlike anything else in the world that the king would die for rebels. See, in most wars, in most battles, uh, the name of the game is to protect the king at all costs. If you play chess, the, the king, he doesn't move. You keep him in the back. You protect him from all the other players. You don't want him to fall. As armies have gone into battle from the beginning of time, they've kept the king at the back. They've protected him at all costs. In fact, in World War II, uh, Winston Churchill wanted to witness the Allies' invasion of Normandy. And he wasn't a king. He was just really high up. And he was, he was a, a, a very important person in England. And he, he was adamant that he was going to be there in a ship watching the Allies storm the, the, the beaches at Normandy. And he couldn't be dissuaded from this command. And General Eisenhower ha, had asked him, he said, listen, you don't need to be there. I don't need to be there. Nobody of your importance needs to be there because something could happen to you and you could fall and it would throw us backwards in a significant way. And so General Eisenhower actually appealed to King George VI and said, listen, we can't have Churchill on the front lines. And King George said to Churchill, well, if you must go and witness the invasion, then I must go as well. And Churchill relented because you can't have the king on the front lines. But that's exactly where Jesus was in his life. He was keeping the law of God perfectly. He was doing for you and me what we couldn't do for ourselves. He was obeying the Father perfectly. See, our king fought and he fights for us. 
And Easter's message doesn't stop with the exaltation of Christ as he rises to his throne, but that is a central part of it, the exaltation of Christ. But we also celebrate the proclamation of Christ. The fourth phrase in this early song is that he was proclaimed among the nations. Think about this. If you're watching this broadcast this morning, you are a, and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's been a time when you trusted him as your Savior. You're a believer because someone proclaimed the gospel to you. You're a believer today because someone proclaimed the gospel yesterday. And they're a believer because someone proclaimed the gospel before them. And they're a believer because in generations past, there were individuals who were willing to be martyred for their faith to advance the kingdom of God in Christ. And we, just as they, are called to proclaim as well. We have a story to tell the nations, one the angels can't tell. And that story is that we have been redeemed. You know, one of the things I got to do in graduate school is we got to research how and when people come to faith in Christ. And one of the things that we noticed is that people tend to visit churches for the first time. People tend to come to faith in Christ after a significant event in their life. So think of, you know, a, a couple gets married, they start thinking about going to church. Or someone moves, and now, now's a good time to go to church. Or they're, they're out of school, then they start school, and they get back into a routine. Well, we need to start going to church again. Or there's a death in the family, and after the funeral, people start asking questions about eternity, and they go to, they start going back to church. I remember after my first son was born, I started getting real serious about church. And I wanted my son to grow up in church, and so we began to visit church and to think about uh, matters of the gospel. So after a significant episode, a significant crisis of experience, people have a tendency to come to faith in Christ and to look into matters of spiritual concern. What bigger crisis, what bigger change has any of us ever experienced than the, the COVID pandemic? Being instructed to shelter in place being asked to quit meeting together in large groups, to quit meeting together as churches so we can stop the spread of this deadly disease. We're, we're surrounded by people that are hurting. They're hurting in their isolation. They're, they're hurting because their finances have been affected. They're, they're hurting because they can't do the things they've always done and they don't have answers. This Easter season, make, maybe we can use our conversations about the coronavirus as an opportunity to have conversations about the gospel. And we can proclaim the Lord who has saved us from our sin. We can proclaim the Lord who is empowering us and strengthening us to get through each day as we look to him anew. You know, the first disciples, the Bible says, they turned the world upside down with their testimonies about who Christ was, what he had done for them, and what he had done in them. Well, the world's been completely turned upside down in the last two months. Maybe now is the most strategic time the church has ever had to testify of the goodness and the grace of God. What he did through Christ, what he did for us, and just as importantly, what he's doing in us as we look to and trust in the resurrection of Christ. And so we celebrate the proclamation of the gospel every time we gather, but we especially celebrate it on Easter Sunday. We look at the next phrase in our song, and we'll go back to the beginning. It says, he was manifested in the flesh, he was vindicated by the Spirit, he was seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world. Easter Sunday is a time to celebrate the reconciliation of broken sinners to Jesus Christ. See, the Bible teaches that if, if, if I come to the end of myself, if I come to the point where I realize I'm a sinner and my sin has separated me from the love of God, and if I look to Christ believing that he's the Son of God 
and that he uh, came to earth and lived a sinless life, if I believe that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin, and I believe that he rose from the grave, and I, and I ask him to save me, trusting in what he did on the cross, the Bible says that God will save me and redeem me from my sin and will adopt me into his family. So, as I said earlier, we can be sheltered in place in God's family, safe and secure from all alarms. See, the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ frees us from the slavery of sin when we believe, when we place our faith and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the gospel demands a response. It's one thing to know who Jesus was. It's one thing to know what Jesus did. It's another thing entirely to respond to that truth. I grew up in a nominally Roman Catholic family. I went to uh, Sunday school, and I, I did uh, First Communion, and I, I went through confirmation classes, and I, 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 you know, the whole nine yards. And so I grew up, and I heard a lot of truths about the gospel. I knew that God was triune. I knew that Jesus was God's son. I knew that he lived a perfect life. I knew that he was born of a virgin. I knew that he died on the cross. I knew that when he died on the cross, he died to pay the penalty for sin. I knew that he rose from the grave three days later. I, I knew that he was seated at the right hand of the Father. But there had never been a time in my life when I believed that Jesus Christ did all of that for me. And believing that he did that for me asked him to save me. And it wasn't until I was 17 years old that someone confronted me with the reality that the gospel demands a response. And so if you're watching this morning or, or, or this evening or whenever it is this video pops up in your playlist or uh, it shows up on your television, I want to ask you a question. Has there ever been a time when you believed? And believing asked Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross and rose from the grave to save you from your sins. That, that's why we do this. We celebrate the fact that God has redeemed us. We celebrate the fact that we've been reconciled. Once we were lost, but now we have been found. And you too can be adopted into God's family by just praying a simple prayer, acknowledging who God is and asking him to save you. So we, we, we're celebrating all of these truths. There's one final one that we celebrate every Easter, every Sunday. We celebrate the future coronation of Jesus Christ as king. Notice how the, the song ends. He was, he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Now, at first glance, it just looks like this says he was, he was taken up into glory or taken up into heaven, but that's not actually what the text says. The Bible, the, the text says he was taken up in glory, which flowing from the rest of this song appears to be a reference to Jesus sitting on his throne, ruling as a king. The Bible teaches that Jesus is alive today, and he's doing at least three things in heaven right now. He's interceding. The Bible teaches that Jesus, as he sits at the right hand of the Father, he's actually praying for you and for me, for all of his brothers, for all of those who have been adopted by God into his family by faith. Not only is he interceding and praying for us, but he's advocating for us. He's constantly speaking and testifying on our behalf that our sins have been atoned for. We are saved and we are safe. And so Jesus says, that one belongs to me, and that one has been redeemed, and that one has been redeemed. And so that means that when the enemy lashes out and hurls an accusation against us, Jesus says, that was dealt with at the cross. It's no longer an issue. He looks to the Father and says, that one is your child. He has been adopted into our family. He is our advocate. And that means I'm not my past. That means I'm not my failures. I'm, I'm not a product of all my struggles and misdeeds. I'm a child of God. And what the Father said of the Son, He now says of me, 
And he now says of you, this is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, and the Bible says he's interceding, he's praying for us, he's advocating for us, and he's waiting for us. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, the Bible says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Jesus Christ is waiting, waiting for the glorious day when the Father's going to look down and say to his son, go get my children. He's waiting for that glorious day when he'll return as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The first time Jesus came, he was crowned with thorns, but in the future as he returns, he will be crowned with power and glory. And that is Easter. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. That's Easter. The king who died our death is the king who gives us life. That's Easter, the central event in human history. And it should be the central event in all of our lives. I don't want to challenge you to make it as much in the days and weeks to come. These are strange times. But think about it. Think about the difference the resurrection made in the life of the disciples after they'd been forced to shelter in place. You think about the night of the crucifixion just before sundown when Jesus' body would have been removed from the cross, hurriedly ushered into a borrowed tomb, no time to adequately prepare the body. Think about the emptiness and the darkness and the uncertainty the disciples felt. This was, gonna, this was the Messiah. This is the one who was going to redeem the world. This, this was going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They placed all their hope and all their confidence in him. Imagine how long those three days must have felt like. Their hopes shattered, their dreams crushed, their world changed radically. Now imagine the joy and the exuberance they felt when first they heard that Jesus was alive, and then they saw that Jesus was alive. That, 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 that time when they were sheltered in place, hiding from the authorities, wrestling with their future, must have seemed like an eternity to them. And I imagine for some of us staying at home, it seems like an eternity to us. I saw one comedian say, you know, the, the last... Two weeks have been the longest decade of my life. I'm starting to feel that way. And, and I, don't, I don't know if there's an end in the foreseeable future. I don't know when life is going to get back to normal. But here's what I do know. Whether life ever returns to any sense of normalcy for you or for me with regard to how we used to live, we do know that Jesus Christ is risen. He's seated on his throne, and his plans will not be thwarted by a virus. And while my future may not be what I expected it to be, I know I'm held safely and securely in the palm of my Lord and Savior, and nothing will separate me from his love, and nothing will separate you from his love either. So here's how I want to challenge you. I've been home for two weeks now, working from home, going out as little as possible, probably going to be home for another four weeks. I'm, I, I'm done watching Netflix. I don't think there's anything left to watch. Um, no more TV shows on the DVR. I've got, I've got all this free time on my hands. And I've been asking myself this question the last few days. What if I just gave a portion of that time to the Lord to dig back into the Scriptures as I've never done before, 
to meditate on the, refle- the resurrection and, and reflect upon how it should be the central, important thing in my life. How would that change my marriage? How would that change my relationship with my children? How would that change my neighborhood and my community? How would it change my church? We don't know why God's allowing all this to happen, but we do know that it's not outside the realm of his control. But there's a greater purpose for why it's happening. But I do know this, we'll we'll never be able to say we didn't have the time to study. We didn't have the time to call a friend or a family member or a neighbor and testify about how God was seeing us through this difficult time. We'll never have more time than we do right now. So let's seize the moment for the glory of God and the good of those around us. And let's allow these dark hours in the history of the world to be transformed to joy through the power of the resurrected King. Let's all look to Him as we charter these strange, uncertain moments in our lives. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you, and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. for the plan of redemption, for the work of Jesus Christ, for his willingness to go to the cross and suffer in our place. And our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've vindicated your Son and raised him from the grave. And we thank you for the power uh, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that opened our hearts to believe the truths of the gospel. And this morning, We pray for a heart of thankfulness and gratitude that celebrates the work of Christ upon the cross. We we pray for hearts of boldness and confidence that we might proclaim the gospel to those who are far from God, for those who are hurting for those who are exhausted as they minister on the front lines. And Father, we pray for hope, gospel hope, that will get us through the next week, the next month, whatever happens in the foreseeable future. And we ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God bless you. I can't wait to see you again in person when the quarantine's lifted. Have a great day. You heard today Pastor Chris mentioned that the Easter story requires a response. Well, what will your response to the Easter story be? Will you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Will you need to follow him in believer's baptism? Would you like to talk with a pastor or submit a prayer request? Simply go to the church website and submit a prayer request, and we will respond and try to help you in any way that we can.